the intro. Thanks for the invite to come here. I, I definitely uh, appreciate it. Um, and let's see, this guy does my forward and back, right? Um, so I have fewer slides than some of our presenters, which means I have more time for Q&A. Um, feel happy to interrupt. Uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand uh, and we'll address it right away. Um, so my first question to the group is, uh, who? just raise your hand if you've heard of Outback Power. All right, great, great. That's 80% of the room. I had no, you know, didn't know, you know, kind of where, I, where we were on that, that level there. Um, so what I'm, I'm going to cover three topics here. Who is Outback Power? Uh, you know, what are we doing? To, uh, what have we been doing? And what are we going to be doing? Um, grid forming and following operation today from our perspective. And then future needs for grid forming and grid following, again, from our perspective. So we're an inverter manufacturer uh, founded in 2001. Um, in the Northwest here has had a, a, a real good collection of talent for doing inverters. Um, and so a group of those people got together and formed Outback back in Ohio. Um, our initial focus has been on on and off grid, residential, solar, and battery based systems. Um, our products today are typically four and eight KVA in their ratings of, you know, single phase residential. Uh, we also resell uh, a line of solar string inverters that are 10 kVA, uh, three-phase rated units. Um, just a few months ago in November, uh, our company was acquired by Enersys. Uh, Enersys is a uh, large battery, uh, you know, company. They sell um, they sell batteries to the Navy for submarines. They do a lot of uh, uh, batteries and, and power electronics um, for battery charging and for uh, traction. If you buy a forklift that has, uh, is battery based, um, you know, high percentage uh, chance that it's got Enersys batteries in it. So, you know, uh, an Outback has, is a portion of what's called the Alpha Technology Group. Um, which, so Enersys acquired Alpha and Outback was part of Alpha. And um, Alpha does power electronics for uh, uh, powering, um, you know, cable and uh, um, uh, communications equipment um, throughout the world. So Enersys is definitely interested in, in our capability um, and uh, and I joined the company about seven months ago uh, to help us, you know, bring us to the future uh, for this, this grid forming, uh, you, know, you know, help move these companies forward. So this is just a simple picture of, you know, the elements that we work with. Um, and I've, I've highlighted with the dotted lines kind of three categories of products that we sell. Um, the simplest is between solar and the battery, we just have chargers that will max power track solar and charge batteries. Um, that's called the FM100 chargers. Um, if you take battery plus AC loads plus AC grid, we have a class of products. Uh, you can pretty much call that radium. Um, and those are four and eight KVA uh, uh, rated units. And then we have a class of products we, we call Skybox, which will take all four of those elements, solar, battery, AC loads, and AC grid. And in that case, um, I didn't want to draw schematics here, that's too, too detailed, but the connection between solar and battery, um, that really is a DC link. So everything is bi-directional in the skybox, except for the solar. No reason to, you know, I don't think we're gonna heat up the solar to melt snow, right? We're not doing that, right? 
Um, now, and, and so for our customers, so let's say we have an off-grid customer, you know, they don't really need an AC grid connection. Um, we can build a whole system based on solar batteries and, uh, and the inverters that'll, you know, in that case, we want to power their AC loads. Some of those customers today want to be able to do what's called AC coupling, which is where you take that, that grid following inverters from maybe other vendors and tie it into the load panel and backfeed the load panel with, uh, uh, you know, third, you know, third party <coughs> units. Today, there's not enough standardization, you know, between how inverters operate that we can just say across the board, we will AC couple with anyone. We have to take a specific, we have to do it case by case. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to name names on the, the manufacturers, but you know, A, B, and C, we have to qualify each manufacturer independently and make sure the behavior of our system plays well with their system. There's just not enough standardization in how, how units are working today. Um, I, I did participate in 1547-2018, and, uh, and I'm also participating in the DOT-1, which is the test protocol. Uh, so that's coming, but it's not in the field yet that will help with standardization. Um, and then for the AC grid connection, uh, you know, I, just your typical generator, we can work with that. Uh, uh, we, we have a contactor output that we can program the system to, you know, turn on the generator if needed and, and or not, and or tie to a grid. So we do something, when I arrived at Outback, I heard a term that I'd never heard before. They call it stacking. And that's where we take our, our individual units and it's a combination of multiple units into a single system. So, and we rate our stacking capability up to 10 units in parallel to form a single system. So that means that we can do systems from eight to 80 uh, KVA. And uh, believe it or not, there are people out there who want, you know, total off-grid operation, uh, you know, in that range. When we do this, um, one unit is designated as master and the remainder of the units are designated as slaves. Um, the AC grid connections, if it's a grid tied system, are all wired in parallel. The AC load connections are all wired in parallel and the batteries may be power paralleled or not. Um, we can work with, uh, uh, we most of the time we work with lead acid based batteries, but we can work with uh, lithium based batteries and when they have the, um, the energy management system for the batteries, we have to qualify those as well one at a time. Manufacturer A, manufacturer B, manufacturer C. There's not enough standardization right now to, you know, that they, they don't all uh, behave exactly the same. And actually getting them to tell you the details of how they behave is difficult. They won't always tell you. Uh, and yet we're the guy they have, to, we have to work with. Did I see a question? Uh, and then just one quick question about the last point. Uh, so you're saying that batteries need not be in parallel connection. So do you have some guidance on what is the best topologies that you want to connect the batteries in? Or is that something very ad hoc? Well, the, so the question was uh, about battery paralleling. Do we have guidance for how best to do that? Uh, we, we do. It, it, it depends on the specific, uh, usually the, the installer, um, you know, with the requirements of the system, you know, knows what they need to do. And we provide guidance to the installers, you know, as to, depending on which product they're using, how best to do that. Um, the majority of our systems use 48 volt batteries. So, um, 
can can you ask a make your question a little more detailed? Yeah, I think I, I, I may have like misunderstood some point. So I was thinking that when you say that is maybe parallel, I was thinking more of like circuit topologies. Um, are you talking about like parallel connections of batteries or can there be like mesh networks of batteries and if mesh then what is the best way to do that? Well, what I so what I mean by paralleling batteries is is physically, you know, the um, there could be a single battery bank. Say you build an eighty kVA system, you could do it with separate batteries to each inverter, or you could take that all those batteries and just do a single battery bank for the entire system. And it's really the the firmware software that controls the individual units that manages the power sharing and the behavior of the battery charging and discharging. You know, is that it? But, but when the individual batteries are in parallel, I think it is much easier to visualize what the stack representation is going to be because you know, batteries are like capacitors, right? So when they're in parallel, you can just like add them up and that represents like the aggregate, for example. I think what was more interesting for me is that the R not part of that bullet and if these batteries are not in parallel connections, then how does stacking work? Well, so you may not, you may choose to not parallel the batteries. If you're using a, a lithium battery bank, um, uh, say these, these units, and they may not, they may not want to parallel with each other because each, each lithium box has its own controller. And, um, so I'm just saying we have the flexibility to, to, to let them be configured as parallel or not. So the majority of my experience has been in grid following operation um, and, you know, or grid tied operation today. So batteries can be charging or discharging and the solar when included is it's managed per the application profile that's programmed into the unit. And my, so one of my, my points I want to emphasize is that I believe that inverters need to be fully, fully flexible and um, not just defined to meet today's standard, but make it flexible enough that if the standards change tomorrow or a new utility comes out with a new set of profiles that you have to meet, you know, make it fully flexible to be able to, you know, uh, uh, survive the length of time. Um, and the inverter, yeah. Okay, next bullet. Inverters operate as AC current sources. So my preferred method of controlling the inverter is hysteretic current control. Um, and I'm not sure I saw that detailed in, in any of the, the background literature for this talk, but, but it, hysteretic current control gives you the ability to operate as an AC current source into a grid that's regulated for voltage and frequency. That, that simple, with full four quadrant operation. Not everyone out there in this industry does that. There's still a lot of people who talk about using DQ control uh, for grid following operation. And it's, you know, anyway, my opinion is, is make it a pure AC source. New requirements for 1547, 2018. Um, a lot of the manufacturers out there today are working to meet these requirements right now. Um, you know, to get their product fleet upgraded to, you know, so that, that when this is, can be tested by UL, you know, we're ready to ship products. Grid forming, standalone operation today. So this is what this, this company has been doing for the last, you know, almost 20 years. And um, AC load is priority. It's is critical. What that means is that um, you know, basically we want to make sure that the AC load is powered until, you know, the battery is pretty much empty. And then you're set. AC grid is monitored for resync and connection. Pretty standard. That's if it exists. Um, 
And as I mentioned, the master is grid forming as a classical voltage source, uh, regulates AC voltage and frequency, may or may not have droop control. In fact, we actually prefer, we don't have droop in our master <laughs> because we want to provide that regulated one per unit voltage to the critical load right up until when the battery runs out of uh, charge. Um, yeah. Um, does the master have a PLA? When operating in the grid forming mode, there really is no PLL. I mean, it, it's, you know, 60 hertz or based on the application that's coded into it. Because if you've got AC coupling from other inverters feeding your load, you may actually want a frequency shift to force them to back off. But the slaves do, right? But the slaves are grid following. And so their, their PLL will be following the master. Um, but there's more to that. Because in our implementations, we use high bandwidth communications from the master, which, which helps to, so that we can precisely control all the slaves. Um, I want to get away from that. You know, I think that's a, a weakness of, of where we are today. Um, the, for example, the, the virtual oscillator papers that, that Brian has written, I mean, I, I see great promise in being able to implement something along those lines you know, almost immediately to eliminate the need for that high bandwidth communication. Because if the individual units can operate autonomously and stable, to changes in load, changes in generation, you know, we don't need, you know, uh, 100 kilohertz communication among all the units. Um, we do limited support for the AC coupled inverters. That just means that we have to qualify individual manufacturers to be able to work with us. 1547-2018 does not dictate requirements when not connected to the grid. So, you know, I kind of see that we, we have some freedom to behave any way we want when we're not connected to the grid. Future needs. Um, for our company, I want us to adopt a more advanced grid forming approaches so that we can achieve infinite stacking. You know, what you saw me describe on grid forming only works with our units talking to our units. You know, it's, it, won't, it wouldn't work well if it's a 50-50 system. Um, and, you know, my goal is to achieve what we call infinite stacking, not limit us to 10 units in parallel. Reduce the communication bandwidth required between parallel units. Eliminate a master-slave control paradigm. System-level microgrid controller is still needed to optimize performance. You know, for example, you may not want, you know, uh, all 10 of your inverters running at 20%. You may prefer, it may be more efficient to run, say, three of them at 100% or whatever the number is, you know, to, to, to operate more efficiently. and basic objectives could be met. And, and so you also need a system that can operate when no grid controller is present. Um, well, right now, in order to take, say, 10 of our, our units to get them to operate in a, in a standalone off-grid application, we have to have a master that's controlling the system and that tells the other nine slaves what to do. Um, so you could eliminate that if you have a, uh, you know, say the virtual oscillator control, you know, the, the droop, some effective uh, droop type characteristics built into all the systems, all the units. And that way one unit could fail, system still operates. Take one unit offline, plug another unit in line, 
system still operates, you know. Okay. I see I have about 12 minutes left and I'm going to mention the topic of unintentional island. I don't know if we have enough time. <laughs> um, this, this actually, I think, is one of the biggest impediments to taking, uh, taking us forward for grid form converters for the larger, you know, connection to, to utilities. Unintentional island, I think this is a huge, uh, huge issue for distribution operators to accept the connection of uh, grid forming inverters to their systems. Um, historically, back in the late 90s and early 2000s, you know, the inverter industry was told by utilities, look, anything weird goes on, we want you to trip offline and go away. And, you know, we heard the message and the standards did not have ride through requirements at that time. And so what we ended up with is an industry where um, inverters would trip at the smallest perturbation in the grid. And we still have a, a pretty decent, there's still a certain penetration of that out there. Um, now, so to me, that's a big challenge is how do we, you know, get the buy-in from the utilities to allow grid forming inverters. Uh, the schematic up here is a, a copy of one of the drafts of the 1547.1. It's, it's a test that's run where on the left you see the actual or simulated uh, EPS or grid. Um, on the right is the unit under test. And then there's basically an RLC uh, balancing circuit that's plugged in. And you, you operate the system, you balance it at the connection point of S3. Once you've got a good balance, you open S3 and you make sure the whole system de-energizes within two seconds. You know, that's a requirement. Now, grid forming inverter, you put a grid forming inverter, it's going to run on all day long. So how do we, I just, I don't know how we solve this. You know, how we, um, uh, you know, it's a standards issue. Future needs for us, um, clear definition of standardization of what microgrid controllers need for communication interfaces. Actually, I was uh, offline, I was speaking with um, a gentleman from Schweitzer Engineering, and he told me they already know how to do this, how to communicate with uh, uh, islands to get them to synchronize uh, before closing, you know, reconnecting an island to a grid. So I, I need to learn more about this, you know, what, you know, how do we do this level of communication uh, to make sure that our equipment is able to uh, uh, respond to those signals. Um, today in 1547, uh, there are three protocols that are called out. Um, I guess I'm highlighting that I need to learn more about, you know, how do we define the, uh, are the communication standards that exist, are they good enough, or do we need a little bit more? Thank you. Um, I, I want to I wanna comment a few other things. I made some notes during so in all of our in all of our new products right now, we have a processor that's running Linux. Now, um, it's probably a solvable problem, but how do we get that that platform to allow <laughs> other application level behavior to be programmed into units? That's a possibility that that that's sitting there. Open question. Um, another comment is our data. So most inverters are sampling um, the grid voltage and currents from the units in the neighborhood of you know, 10 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz. That raw data is in there. Um, you know, I look at SunSpec as a protocol for, for communicating to the inverters. It, it doesn't have a lot of bandwidth for pulling out information that could be useful. You know, each inverter is potentially a, a data point that could even give you waveforms. You know, I'm, for example, the, the, and the horsepower that we have in there, I mean, I, I thought five years ago I was driving my processor, I thought of it like a BMW, and now my processor, five years later, 
I think it was like a Maserati. I mean, I'm doing, I'm able to compute, you know, THD on multiple signals, you know, live. Uh, it's just the amount of processing power that's in there is great. But how do we get that data out of that data point out and usable to the rest of the world? That's a challenge as well. All right, now I'm done. Okay. Thank you very much, Greg. How about some questions? Duncan? Um, yeah, I can probably do that. I wonder if you could comment a little bit more on the um, transforming balance issues we see in terms of uh, decentralization that we've got right now and whatnot. But in this case, you mentioned the virtual oscillator control stuff. Do you see challenges to using the just the standard kind of group approaches that have been around for a while? Is there a reason you see that being a problem or in the VOC being a better solution? Well, I, um, I, maybe I'm a little bit biased. I mean, most engineers show up to the party with a little bit of their own bias. And I've worked a lot on unintentional islanding where the RLC circuit is, you know, um, part of how you prove that uh, your method will destabilize an island. And so when I saw the VOC methods, and I see it includes the RLC, to me, you know, there's an elegance to that. Um, and you need a little bit more to be able to stabilize that behavior. Um, uh, but, but in the end, I, I, I'm not saying, I don't think I really want to say I'm going to pick one or the other, you know, DQ with Droop or the VOC or whatever. I think we've, I think that's all very solvable and we've got a pretty good handle on that. Um, it'll be my job to evaluate which one is easiest to implement and put it into our units for our, for our needs. Um, the, the harder question is, I think, a standards issue. Um, how do we convince the, you know, we, we need to, to turn off unintentional islanding protection and enable um, and, and how we do that. That's, that's a bigger question. Uh, that's a bigger question. I don't have the answer for that. Charlie's got his hand up. Thanks. Uh, Greg, this is a real great uh, picture of someone at the far end of the distribution world. Two questions. You as a manufacturer, do you see UL1741 SA as an interim step before 1547-2018 is adopted and all the supporting standards infrastructure is in place? It, yes, the, the SA is an interim step. Um, the 1741 is going to get rewritten to reference the 1547.1. And when that happens, the SA itself will go away and, and it be replaced by a reference to the dot one. I'm listening to a lot of smart people, I get the impression SA gets you all over 80% of the way there. So it's just an incremental leap. Yes, yes. That incremental leap will is in Q, uh, there's a huge number of tests that are being added. And here's a test of this, the bulk power world and penetrating down to your world. Do your applications engineers ever support providing um, data or models for interconnection application purposes? Not at this point. We're not, uh, we're not being asked to. Okay. So uh, another item is as part of your product offerings, there isn't a simplified single line positive sequence model for your inverter yet. Well, or so the majority of what we do is single phase. And so, I mean, I don't even think of single phase well, you in terms of balance that out for your processing. <laughs> yeah. And real quickly, unintentional islanding being disabled is a provocative way to put it. You'll still need to meet the unintentional islanding requirement. But is your point, you'll have other mechanisms to uh, manifest that? Because I don't think utilities will ever allow random unintentional islanding. I. Sounds like a yes. <laughs> <laughs> so great. Um, as we transition into the grid forming paradigm, uh, you mentioned some challenges and one of the other islands. How about power quality and drive? Do you see the the uh, interconnection standards evolving itself to accommodate these? resources or do you see the sources having to adhere 
to the present. So, so I do think some of the power quality things are going to have to change. Um, if you're grid following, they want you to inject a clean sine wave into the grid. You know, there's THD requirements or TRD requirements for, for the harmonics and the current. But when you switch over to grid forming, you, you, that needs to go away. You know, stop trying to deliver a clean sine wave because you may have loads that you have to supply that have harmonic current requirements. And so, you know, your grid forming exactly what it needs to be, I don't know, but, but uh, the conversation needs to shift. Okay, we got one more question. Time for one more question. Yeah, concern uh, if it's all only a joke and me. Uh, I have a, a question or, or maybe a comment on the unintentional island. Um, in Germany, I was in the group on the round table in the 90s when we decided on this issue. And uh, I think it's very helpful for such a question to discuss, to find out why we do not want this unintentional island. Uh, one, one point was this uh, uh, the question of the, uh, the safety issues for the workers and so on. Um, this is sort of a dispute. The question is, is there any other reason why you do want to avoid unintentional islands? I think we have to come from the reasons in this discussion and not uh, just uh, uh, for the ideology of and, and that's you're, you're correct. It, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, one other reason I would hear people talk about is reclosers. Um, you know, uh, I'm not an expert in protection, but I, I've heard the word of voltage blocking reclosing and not everyone has that. And that's a recloser that senses that there's still a voltage out there and it prevents the unit from reclosing into an energized circuit. Um, I think that's what it is. That, that would be one other conversation. All right, well, let's thank our speaker. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.